this is a very important topic that we um, we are here to learn more about. Um, obviously, COVID-19 is um, is a new um, pandemic, and um, we are to le trying to learn as much as we can about it. And um, even in normal times, um, children's are always children are always um, a big concern for parents, um, and it becomes even more. Um, concerning during this time uh, since children, especially in case of pandemic, uh, children will always be children, you know, they will play around, they would touch things and um, they would be least like, less likely to, uh, to understand uh, that there is a disease out there. So this is definitely a very important subject for parents. Um, I am myself as a child of uh, four kids um, and uh, I definitely want to learn as much as I can about this um, and uh, just a little bit of logistical uh, things uh, most participants are all going to be muted but you can always uh, put your questions um, and comments on the uh, comment or chat box um, if you have any questions you can also ask questions you can raise hands or you can put in some information that you want to share with the entire uh, panel and with the entire uh, group. Uh, the session is being taped, so if you miss anything, you can definitely be able, you will be able to um, listen to the entire uh, event. Uh, and again, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I myself, I'm very happy to be with you guys. I am. I. I, I mean, I, I'm very passionate about it because. I am a member of the three organizations that are very uh, uh, part of this, uh, being the city council member in Clarkston and serving on the board of both uh, PRC and also CDF. So on behalf of all of those, thank you so much again. Uh, welcome. And uh, I want to uh, uh, get uh, Dr. Ashley Smith Owens to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Owen. Okay, so today's agenda for the webinar is as follows. I'll give a brief presentation on what we know about COVID-19 and kids ages birth through five, and we'll be joined at the end of that brief presentation by Dr. Susan Reynes, a pediatrician in the DeKalb County Board of Health in Kaiser Permanente, Georgia. Um, so she will help me to answer any questions questions or clarifications at that point. I have some questions to pose to her. And at that point, we will move on to our second panelist, um, Mr. Alashu Desta, who's going to talk about what families are asking about COVID and what they are experiencing. And then our third pa panelist, Ms. Miriam Gibson from Scottsdale Early Learning, is going to talk a little bit about the decisions that child care centers are making and what child care centers are doing to protect teachers, children, and families. And then we'll have time at the end for a participant and panel conversation. So again, um, you know, if you think of questions that you'd like answered as we talk, um, please enter them in the chat or jot them down and, and hopefully we'll have time at the end to get back to that. Okay, next slide, Erica, thank you. Just a quick acknowledgement um, of someone who helped me put together this presentation, um, Seja, um, I hope she's on, um, so just wanted to give a, a shout out to her. Okay, next slide. There's my shout out to Seja, thank you. Okay, so many people are already aware, certainly of what COVID is, but just a very brief overview. Um, coronaviruses are a, a large group of viruses that cause illness, so we're certainly, they're certainly not new to us. Um, but this particular virus circulates um, a, a, you know, around the United States and causing upper respiratory symptoms. Um, some of the coronavirus il illnesses cause more serious illness than others. Um, and COVID-19 um, in particular is, uh, is caused when the virus or is, is infected in between people when viruses um, contact other people's eyes, nose, mouth, or lungs. Um, so usually that occurs when a person who's infected uh, coughs or sneezes, um, releasing respiratory droplets in the air. Um, or onto, for example, a child's face or nearby surface. Next slide. In terms of what COVID-19 
symptoms look like babies and children. Um, generally, what the science is telling us is that COVID-19 symptoms are milder in children than in adults. Uh, one of our recent studies suggests that 90% of children who tested positive had positive had mild symptoms or none at all. Um, but in terms of symptoms, we see fever, cough as common in both adults and children. Shortness of breath is more likely actually to be seen in adults and children can have pneumonia um, with or without other symptoms, um, including sore throat, fatigue, and or diarrhea. Next slide. In terms of what the risk is of a child becoming sick, we do know that children are not at a higher risk for COVID-19 than adults. There is, although rare, a condition um, where a small percent of children have developed a life-threatening condition called multi-system inflammatory syndrome, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, children with underlying medical conditions, so for example, asthma, obesity, heart disease, or an immune condition may be at risk for more severe illness from COVID-19, so it is important to keep children protected during this time, particularly more children. Next slide. In terms of the risk of a child infecting other people, the CDC has confirmed that adults can give their children the virus and children can spread to adults. So we know that infection can go either way. The CDC also says that children can spread the virus to adult members of their own household. And we know from our evidence that um, contact within a household um, is, is very common. And a recent study from South Korea showed that children over 10 are seem to be spreading the virus in similar ways to adults. Um, however, children under 10 were much less likely to spread the disease to adults. And that's what our current evidence is indicating. Next slide. So the question, should children be tested, and if so, when? So the, the answer to that is really, it depends. Um, and parents, caregivers should talk to a child's doctor about testing to inquire about whether that's necessary. Um, doctors may consider testing the child if the child has underlying health problems, as I discussed a minute ago. Um, and certainly if a child is developing symptoms, um, that's an indication that that child needs to be seen. Um, so calling the child's doctor and in more severe illness, taking the child to the emergency room may be important to do. Next slide. So I wanted to talk very briefly about pregnancy. Um, so we're learning more and more about uh, COVID-19 in pregnant women. Um, experts don't know if pregnant women are more likely to get COVID-19. However, pregnant women may have a higher risk of worse disease than individuals who are not pregnant. Um, and they can also have more problems uh, like they do with other respiratory viruses like the flu. So it is important to follow recommended precautions for pregnant women. Next slide. In terms of what the risk is for unborn babies, um, so fetuses or for newborn babies, um, there's not enough research yet to know if COVID-19 can spread to babies during pregnancy or birth. And the virus has not actually been found in amniotic fluid or breast milk, um, but some babies born to mothers with coronavirus have tested positive for the virus. So doctors recommend testing healthy babies who are born to mothers with COVID-19 if tests are available. And it's really still too early to tell how COVID-19 might affect pregnancy or a fetus. Uh, some pregnant women with COVID-19 have had problems like premature birth, but we're not certain yet whether the virus was what caused that. Newborn babies can catch COVID-19 after birth, certainly, and this is why doctors may recommend temporarily separating a mother from her infant if the mother has had a positive COVID-19 test at the time of delivery. Next slide. So just talking briefly about how to protect children. And so the next few slides are some recommendations. Um, the first is, is to keep hands clean, to wash hands often. Um, if soap and water aren't available, to use hand sanitizer, covering the mouth and nose, uh, throwing away tissues that you're using, and then washing your hands again. 
avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. So the same precautions that are true for us as adults. Um, having your ki having kids wash hands immediately after returning home, as well as after going to the bathroom and before eating or preparing food, and showing young children how to create soap bubbles by rubbing their hands together, how to get the soap between the fingers and all the way to the ends of the fingers, including the thumb and the backs of their hands. Um, and it, for example, including encouraging kids to sing the entire happy birthday song twice, which is about 20 seconds, uh, so that they spend enough time that they need to get their hands clean. Next slide. Um, avoiding close contact. Contact certainly is one way um, to practice social distancing. Um, other, other strategies, minimizing trips outside of your house, um, you know, certainly making sure that um, you don't allow your child to have play dates, for example, um, to, um, you know, describe to your child to have appropriate distances between that child and other people. You can describe that distance to your child as about the length of a door or an adult bicycle um, and encouraging your child to keep in touch with friends and loved ones, say, for example, through phone calls or video chats instead of in person at this time. Next slide. Certainly keeping your house clean, as clean as possible. So, um, you know, cleaning things like tables, doorknobs, chairs, light switches, things that are commonly touched. Um, changing your baby's changing table and surfaces that your child often touches. Um, for example, a craft table, toy chest, all of the toys that he or she is using, rinsing off um, any toys that are touched and making sure they're dry completely, um, making sure that you're washing your hands after handling your child's belongings. Um, and if, certainly if you're caring for a child with COVID-19, washing hands after diaper changes. Um, and washing babies' bedding and toys. Next slide. Wearing cloth face masks is, is incredibly important. Um, the, this advice that the CDC recommends about wearing face cloth face coverings in public places where it's difficult to avoid close contact with others. This is based on data showing that people with COVID-19 can transmit the virus before realizing that they have it, so before they have any symptoms. It's important to note that we, um, that the CDC is not recommending putting a face mask on children who are younger than two, a child who has any breathing problems, or a child who has a condition that would prevent him or her from being able to remove the mask. Next slide. And then finally, keeping up with well child visits and vaccines. This is very important, especially for infants and young children under the age of two. Um, so we want to make sure that um, healthcare providers um, are, are certainly um, still able to see children get them vaccinated with all of their well child visits and most um, healthcare providers are doing a great job separating the sick children from well children inside uh, healthcare facilities. Um, so it's important that if a child is due for a well visit to take the child to the doctor and talk to the doctor about the safety steps being taken at their facility if you're concerned. The last slide here is a screenshot of some information that uh, you can certainly jot down um, for people who are interested in getting tests. Um, and I will kind of move now quickly to bring in our panelists to this discussion, Dr. Susan Reines, um, and wanted to start off by posing a few questions that we've heard from the community that many folks have um, expressed expressed um, and get our, our pediatrician to weigh in on some of these questions. Um, so Dr. Reynas, I was wondering if first you could address this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and who is at risk. I know this has been a concern for many people because the condition can be so serious. Yes. So first, I would just like to say thank you so much for inviting me to participate, and I thought your presentation was excellent. Um, so multi-system inflammatory syndrome in childhood, uh, CDC has named it MIS-C, um, and it is a newly recognized, but fortunately very, very rare illness that has been associated with COVID-19 infection in children and in teenagers as well. In fact, it tends to be children who are a little bit older, 
uh, mostly over the age of five and six and has ranged up through the teen years. Um, with MISC, children develop inflammation in their body generally a few weeks after the initial COVID infection. And that initial COVID infection may be asymptomatic or it might be mildly symptomatic. And many, in several of the cases, there was no history of COVID, ex COVID infection in the child or teenager, but there was a history of exposure. Children can develop fever. Usually the fever lasts for more than three days. They can have diarrhea, they can have abdominal pain, rashes are common, redness of the eyes is common as well. Children may be very fatigued, they may have some difficulty breathing, they can complain of chest pain. I typically tell my patients about the existence of this syndrome, but I do emphasize that it is very, very rare. But if children develop any of these symptoms, it is very important for them to contact their physician. And if they don't have a primary care physician, it's important that they go over to the emergency room. And in our community, in the Clarkston community, I think the Children's Health Care of Atlanta is going to be the best emergency room to go to. Most children who do have this syndrome, almost all, will need to be hospitalized but with intensive care management, with supportive care, the overwhelming majority of children have done very well. And again, I just want to emphasize that this has gotten a lot, there's been a lot in the news about this, especially a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago when this was first described, but it is quite rare. And in general, COVID disease in children is generally mild disease. Great, thank you. So I know one question, or maybe I'll, I'll kind of ask these two questions together that is coming up for many of us um, recently and kind of thinking about this in terms of the family unit. If someone is diagnosed with COVID, how long should that person remain separated in isolation or quarantine? Um, and when can they go back to work? And kind of uh, related to that question, if someone is exposed but not yet diagnosed with COVID, how long should they quarantine or isolate themselves? So kind of both people with, who've maybe been exposed and then also same question for people who are, ha have a diagnosed COVID-19. Okay, so the first thing is that we usually use the term isolation when someone has actually been diagnosed with COVID infection. And we use the word quarantine when someone has had an exposure, but they haven't been diagnosed. So let's start with an exposure. If someone has had a significant exposure, and we call a significant exposure a household contact, or um, you've been within six feet of somebody for 10 minutes or longer. That is considered a significant exposure. So it's not being in the same building as somebody. It's not being in the same grocery store, even in a church, if people were fairly distant from each other, that would not be considered a close exposure. But with an exposure, most of the time, an individual who's going to get sick will get sick within the first five days. However, the incubation period can last up to 14 days, and it is recommended that that person with a close exposure quarantine for a full 14 days, okay? In the case where someone has been diagnosed with COVID infection and they are instructed to isolate, we typically tell them they should isolate from the 10 days from the first day of illness and an additional and this has actually just changed. We used to say 72 hours of no symptoms, but now it's 24 hours of no fever, not requiring any fever medication at all. So a minimum of 10 days and then possibly some additional time, an additional 24 hours if someone, for example, still had some symptoms or fever on day 10. Is that clear? It, it is, yeah. yes, thank you, that's helpful. So a number of, of um, questions have come up from some of, from some of our, our community stakeholders, specifically around what families and caregivers might need to do with children who have special needs um, during this time. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. 
Do they require yeah. kind of special considerations with COVID? Sure. So certainly some children are going to be higher risk of having severe COVID infection. And some children with special needs may be at higher risk. Typically, we say that children who have complex medically complex disease, so those might be children who have cerebral palsy, those may be children who require uh, G-tube, gastric tube feedings, may require oxygen, um, those children will certainly be at higher risk. Additional children who might be at higher risk are children who have diabetes or children who have sickle cell. Obesity, just as it is a risk factor in adults, may be a risk factor in children children as well. And so for those children, really for everybody, but particularly for those higher risk groups, you want to do the things that you mentioned in your presentation. So practicing really good hand hygiene, um, keeping your home as clean as possible, avoiding contact with individuals um, who don't live in the same home, uh, wearing a mask when you leave the home. Uh, those are going to be very important things. Another issue that has come up for medically complex children or children with special needs is they may not have access to the services that they usually rely on. So they may need to have regular visits with their doctors. They may, may need to have physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy visits, and a lot of doctor's offices, therapist's offices are closed. We recommend that those children reach out to those providers. Many providers are keeping up with the children through telephone appointments, through video visits, if the patient, if the family has the capacity to do that. So we do encourage families to reach out to those providers. Additionally, children who have special needs may require many medications. Um, and it's good to always make sure that you have enough medications on hand. I know for children who have Medicaid, they may only be given one month of medication at a time. It's really important to keep up with your supply of medicine. And also, if you have any um, particular medical equipment needs, nebulizer, you want to make sure you have a working nebulizer, that you have tubes and face masks, uh, etc. So those are some important, I think, issues that really apply to the special needs population. Mm -hmm. One thing as a, a parent of a two-year-old, I was hoping you could uh, give families and caregivers, people who work with little ones, some guidance about how to get these little ones to wear face masks. As a pediatrician, do you have some thoughts about how to help little ones keep these masks on. Yeah, um, a, a few thoughts. It's, it can be very tricky. And first, I do want to emphasize that really children two and over are the ones that should be wearing masks. Occasionally, I'll have a baby come into the office with a mask, baby in a car seat. And, in, you know, for really little ones, it does it, it, it is hazardous for those children to wear a mask. So best not to wear a mask. And also for children who have uh, special needs who may not be able to remove a mask on their own. Uh, if there's a risk of suffocation, you don't wanna wear masks. But for everyone else, masks work and we should be using masks. So how do you get a, a small one to wear a mask? I think masks initially can seem very frightening to children. I think for a lot of kids, it's just a matter of getting used to it. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has made a few recommendations that I'll share with you. They recommend do a little arts and craft activity with a mask, decorate the mask, make it a very personal mask. Um, and so it can be fun to wear that mask. Another suggestion that they have is to stand in front of the mirror with your child, both of you masked. So the child just gets used to seeing themselves masked and then it won't be quite as frightening. Um, another suggestion was to make a mask for a stuffed animal or a doll and actually just let it sit in the child's room so the child also gets used to sitting, looking at a mask. Um, and show your child pictures of other kids wearing a mask. I think it'll make it less frightening to that child. Um, I do wanna point out also that some children who might be at higher risk of infection, 
maybe a, a child who is medically fragile, uh, who's a little bit older, may benefit from a true surgical mask as opposed to just a cloth mask to provide a little better protection. And so it's best if you have a child who is medically fragile or special needs to discuss it with your pediatrician. So I you know, want to kind of maybe conclude with a question that we could probably have an entire session on um, just by itself. But I'm wondering if you could offer some guidance about how families and other people who work with families and children, um, how we can collectively help children and families manage stress and anxiety during this time. It's a really difficult time for everyone. And I think families are under just an inordinate amount of, of stress. Um, what would you tell the families that you work with and how to navigate this? Yeah, so I completely agree with you. I think that everyone is under stress. Parents are under stress. Children are under stress. Physicians, uh, everybody is under stress right now. and. Young children um, also are feeling stress, and they may they they may express their anxieties and their fears in different ways. So some children may have temper tantrums. Some kids may be irritable. Some kids may not sleep as well. They may be very clingy. So first, to recognize that your young child is feeling stress. Um, some things that you can do, I think, is to just reassure. Parents can't make this problem go away. Doctors can't make this problem go away. But reassure your children that you're going to be there for them, that the child's family is going to be there for them, and they're going to get they're going to get through this together. And this is not going to last forever. Um, be more affectionate. Maybe give some extra hugs if you feel like that would benefit your child. I think it's important to also limit your child's exposure to the news and to conversation that adults might be having in the home that may really, you know, be dwelling on the numbers and the deaths and the hospitalizations. So really try to have, keep it more low key, especially when you're around that child. Try to stay calm when your child is having a temper tantrum. I think that that can be really difficult, but that is important. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that the child is having a tough time, that times are different. The child can't go outside like they're used to. Maybe they can't play with a friend um, the same way that they had before. But think of other activities to do together. There is so much that you know families can do in the home. They can read together. They can play board games together. They can do puzzles together. Um, they can video chat with family, although I do want to probably recommend not too much screen time, but I think to provide a little bit of social interaction, it, it, it's a good idea. Cooking projects and go outside, go for walks. It's perfectly safe to go outside, have a picnic with your child. Encourage creative play as well. Let kids get messy, play with crayons, uh, paint, make, make things. Uh, think of new activities to do. And that is a lot of pressure for, for parents, I think, but that is going to ease the stress for the child. I think it's also important to create or keep structure in the day. Have the child wake up at the usual time, eat meals together at the usual time, have active play time, quiet play time, keep bedtimes intact. All structure definitely helps children feel safe. Um, I would say avoid punishing your child by hitting your children. There have been some increased reports of um, some physical violence in, in, in households. And, and so it is important if you're feeling stressed to kind of walk away for a minute. And parents need to take time for themselves as well. Uh, it's very hard to be around children all the time. If there are two parents in the household, free one up to go out, do some exercise. It's important that parents sleep, that they eat well, that they have a little bit of interaction with other adults. So recognizing their own stress is important. Um, sometimes children act out because they're bored. Recognize that. Think of some different activities to do with kids. So it's, 
it, it's, it is difficult, but I think, you know, with some creativity, with some planning, uh, with structure, I think we'll all get through this. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, your, your point about getting outside brings up maybe a follow-up question for me about, um, ab about outside activities. So, um, you know, I, I see a lot of people in the community um, still playing soccer together, for example, um, a lot of young ones, um, you know, out on the soccer fields. I just wonder if you could provide some really explicit guidance about what outdoor activities are safe for families and what are not safe activities outside. Yeah, so I think safe activities would include families staying together. So if a family was gonna play soccer together, families that were used to being together, that live in a household together, I think that that's absolutely fine. I think that playing with a lot of other children in the neighborhood is not okay right now. I think that if you are cohorting with another family, and in some neighborhoods, people are doing it. Maybe there's two families that live next door. They've only been home. They've only been seeing each other. I think in that case, it is okay to allow the children to play together, to throw ball. But a group of neighborhood kids, although I love the idea of that in normal times. I don't think that this is the time to do that. I think going for a walk with the family, going for a hike, um, riding a bicycle is a solitary activity. Um, some people like to play tennis. And actually, with tennis, if you're playing singles tennis, you can physically distance. Uh, so I think if, if somebody is a tennis player, I know that some of the neighborhood pools have opened up. They're limiting the number of children that can come to a neighborhood pool, I think, and it's outdoors. So I think that that's probably okay. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'll just pause for the next couple minutes and check in with Erica and or Linda and see if there have been any questions posed in the chat directly to what we've been discussing thus far. There's no questions. Um, there is one comment that there's contradictory guidance about children wearing masks outside. Um, but outside of that, there hasn't been. So if you do have any questions, feel free to enter those in the chat and we can discuss. So I think if a child oh. is going to be outside and not and is going to be more than six feet from other children, that child doesn't need to wear a mask. But if, children, if people are going to be closer together, closer than six feet, or if you were attending an event where there were you know, a number of people, we certainly saw uh, some of the protests in Atlanta, uh, even maintaining a distance, it would be a good idea to wear a mask in that situation. It looks like there's a hand up and, and then they put into the chat box, how can we encourage to go to the swimming pool? How is it safe? How should we encourage? How can we encourage to go to the swimming oh. pool? Yeah, I, I think that every family is going to have to make the decision on their own whether or not they feel safe. I, I know a lot of families personally that don't feel safe going to a swimming pool. I think the swimming pools have opened up with good intentions. The kids do need to get outside. They do need some things to do this summer. Um, I think for families that are comfortable with it, then it's, it, it's a safe thing to do, but I would never honestly want to push a family that wasn't feeling safe about it. And certainly in our state, in our county right now, we're seeing still a lot of COVID cases. And so a lot of families won't be comfortable. Um, I, I looked at the Georgia Department of Public Health website today and 4,000 more cases were reported today. And we are seeing more cases in kids. And so I, if a family is not comfortable, Erica, I would not push them to do it. And then there was one follow-up question about the pool. Um, is it safe at all? <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't think we have good data. Um, Ashley, I don't know if you've seen any data specifically about pools. 
I think that we must maintain distancing at the pool. I think the pools definitely need to limit the number of families that are coming in. I think that the county has decided that they can go ahead and open it up. And so I, I haven't seen data either way. Yeah, I was about to say, I haven't seen the, the data one way or another. I think to kind of piggyback on your comment, um, Susan, about you know, looking at a specific pool kind of case by case basis, because I've seen a pool where they're being very careful about the numbers coming in at a time and the pool space is big enough where families can really socially distance themselves quite easily. Um, but that's that pool. And so I wonder if maybe it's, it's more about the pool's policies and the, how big the pool is, how many people are at that pool at any given time, and kind of this, the how well each family can social distance it seems more like a kind of case-by-case case <laughs> basis in some ways. Certainly anyone who's high risk shouldn't be going to a pool. That's very helpful, Dr. Reynas. Thank you so much. Um, it's time for us to move on to our next um, panelist. So I'm going to turn it over to Alashu Desta and Roberta Malavenda to talk about um, what families are asking about COVID-19, what they're experiencing as a result of the virus. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm Roberta Malavenda, and I'm with CDF Action, a group that works in Clarkston. Um, mainly we listen and we learn and we bring people together and then we try to act. We very recently developed the with the city of Clarkston, the Clarkston Early Learning Network uh, task force at, where we'll be looking at uh, equitable policies, programs, and practices around early learning to ensure that all children are healthy, safe, nurtured, and are prepared for school and beyond. So it's with really great pleasure that we participate in this uh, webinar this evening. And it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce you to Alatra Desta, who lives in Clarkston. I had the pleasure of meeting him, I believe, at a complete count census meeting and found out that he was a real activist and really liked to work in Clarkson uh, and wanted to be more involved. And he probably shouldn't have told us that because we're getting involved in everything right now. So I keep telling him to be careful. Um, he works as a family advocate with uh, Head Start and just received his master's in global health. And we're really excited about that because that was like, I think last month. And um, he is a new member of the City of Clarkson Early Learning uh, Task Force. And the idea for this webinar actually originated in part from those uh, conversations. As part of the task force, we are engaging in formal and informal conversations with families about early learning. And Alachua agreed to talk to families with children birth to five about COVID-19 and about early learning. And tonight, he's going to give us a little overview of some of those conversations and share some of his own observations. So welcome, Alachua, and welcome to all of the panelists this evening. So my first question, uh, from our conversations, you shared that families seem to understand and practice physical distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, and using hand sanitizers. However, um, you said that many of the families told you that they were having trouble with physical distancing. Um, can you explain what's going on with families and, and, and physical distancing and some of the other um, uh, preventive activities that we know about? How are families doing with those? Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Ms. Roberta and everybody, good evening. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my experience working with Head Start Parents in Clarkston. And also I wanted to mention that the information I am providing today doesn't represent the organization I am working for, that is community development organization. So uh, I wanted to answer the question, you know, I 
have a chance to spoke uh, with some Head Start parents about COVID. And I have uh, uh, the experience working with them remotely during this pandemic closure. So uh, most of the families I have interviewed stated they have enough information about how COVID-19 is transmitted from one, to pers one, from one person to another person. They also stated methods of prevention like social distancing, wearing face masks, washing hands, uh, and they are trying their best to apply those prevention methods every day. But most of them mentioned that sometimes it is not easy for them to practice social distancing, especially for their children when they play with other children in their apartment complex. Uh, unless the parents stay there and watch them, they really can't uh, apply this social distancing for their children. Uh, and some of some, them also stated that, you know, in some culture, uh, if a person or your relatives comes to your house for a visit without prayer notice, you must let inside and stay within. So it was hard for them, you know, to apply social distancing. So these are some of the things they mentioned to me uh, regarding, you know, how COVID is transmitted and what they do to prevent themselves and their children from the virus. So social distancing um, or physical distancing is um, not very um, common because you let everybody in and everybody, particularly in apartment complexes, knows each other. I know um, in the Muslim community, there's a big Eid um, event on Monday, uh, Friday, I'm sorry, and people are really debating whether or not to have how many family members to come. But there are a lot of religious uh, kinds of things that are going on as well as um, in apartment complex, it's really hard for social and physical distancing. And so one of the things that, that we wanna do as a, as a task force is really talk about how can we get that message out even clearer and even better um, so that families really understand and have some options about um, physical uh, uh, distancing. Um, one of the things you, you mentioned to me that I think is really true is that the general public, as well as families that we know, are often confused about the virus, what to believe and, and what to do. Um, and you said that there was some confusion about COVID-19 among some of the families you know. So I was gonna ask you if you could share with us what kinds of questions do families have about the virus? What are they confused about? And how do they get their information about the virus? How do families get information? What do they think and what are they confused about? Uh, yes, uh, uh, previously uh, Dr. Susan mentioned uh, or answered some of their com uh, I mean, confusions. So uh, I'm happy for that. So uh, when I spoke with them and they told me that uh, they have different questions because they are getting different information instantly about COVID and it is changing from time to time. So there are so many confusions they have. Some of the confusions they told me uh, are, uh, for example, if a person uh, is, uh, is a person reinfected again with COVID once he or she is recovered or became immune. Uh, and also uh, they are confused for how long a child above age two uh, needs to stay wearing a mask at a time, you know, for how long he should, you know, or she should wear a mask. And also, uh, what if uh, my child gets the virus? Is there any health facility specific to children who are infected with COVID? Because they think there is a, spe a special treatment for children who get infected, you know, with COVID. And also, uh, they said, uh, are the symptoms of COVID the same? on ch children like uh, adults? Do they have the same type of symptoms? These are some of the major confusions they have. And they also, most of them told me that they got information about COVID from different sources, you know, from Facebook, from their churches, you know, some churches 
provide education about COVID for their respective uh, community. And they also stated they use some news apps, you know, they are getting instantly some, some uh, information about COVID. Uh, and friends and peer groups, you know, they talk. And that is how they got information uh, about COVID. So there still is some confusion um, out there. I think one of the purposes that we had tonight was to um, hear from uh, a pediatrician and other experts so that we can begin to, as uh, people working with families, we can begin to get the correct information out even as it changes. And so one of our hopes is that tonight, I think we have some um, uh, parent educators and we have some um, health promoters and we really need to get the word out to the people that have day-to-day -day contact with families about the correct information about COVID. And hopefully this presentation will go somewhat to help do that this evening. Um, it's interesting that a lot of families get their information from their churches, Facebook, friends, and what's up, and some of that information is not correct. We hope that they start getting more information from trusted messengers like family advocates and their own pediatrician, right? So that's one of our, our goals is to get that correct information out there. So one of the questions that, that came up um, was, are families taking their children for immunizations or well baby checks? And um, are people afraid to go to the doctors? I think actually Susan brought that up in a meeting that she was afraid that that wasn't happening. And so I asked you specifically to talk to families about are they taking their babies to well baby visits and are they seeing their pediatricians when their uh, children get sick? Uh, actually, I think uh, those parents whom I spoke with for the purpose of this presentation, all of them stated that they took their children to their pediatrician for their regular well baby checks, checkup, uh, and also for their immunization. But they said if their children happen to have like a minor pain, they tend to keep their children home and treat them at home to minimize the risk of, you know, infected, uh, the risk uh, of getting the virus if they took the children uh, to the pediatrician or their doctor. So most of them told me that they, they took their children for their regular checkups and immunization. Maybe it's something we want to continue to um, investigate and, and keep getting that word out because we know that's important, right? And uh, maybe uh, Dr. Susan can also share some information on that as well. Uh, I talked to a colleague who works for um, uh, public health and her job is to call every new parent, every new mom after the birth of her baby. And uh, she also sends them a packet and she used to go visit them. But now, of course, she's not visiting them, but she's calling them on the phone. And so I asked her, do you think those parents are seeing their pediatrician? And she said the very first thing they ask, if they don't have a pediatrician, is how can I find one? And evidently, that's first on their mind. So that's pretty good news. Uh, but it's something we really want to keep uh, checking about. Um, you also mentioned, and this came up earlier, um, that families are under a lot of stress. Um, could you share a little bit about what they're concerned about and what are some things that are going on in the community to perhaps help mediate, mitigate some of that stress? Uh, yes, as we all may know, many people have become unemployed due to the pandemic. Uh, and most of these Head Start parents have a very limited income. As a result of uh, uh, this, their income has drastically decreased and some of them haven't get their weekly unemployment benefit yet due to many factors so that they are facing shortage of money, you know, to pay their rent, utility bills, and other household expenses. As a result, they become more stressed to properly take care of their children in the household. Even the costs of, you know, hand sanitizer, masks, and clinic, uh, I mean, cleaning equipment is and affects uh, and increased their monthly expense. Uh, it has indirect impact, you know, on their uh, monthly expense. So even 
uh, some parents are also trying to apply for food stamp and other assistances. Uh, I remember one parent told me that he has um, a, a misconception or misinformed that if he applies for food stamp, he may uh, uh, it may affect negatively his citizenship application in the future. I think someone told him about this, you know, if you apply or if you receive government assistance or a food stamp, you know, in the future, you might not be approved for uh, citizenship. So there are such type of uh, misconception among the community. So we need to, you know, educate and continue uh, uh, teach them, you know, about what is going on, what is the eligibility criteria to apply for some government assistances. So mainly they are stressed, you know, because they are losing their job and uh, they are facing a financial shortage to cover their uh, costs, you know, living costs. These are the main things I, I learned from them. The stress is real, real and it's not it's having the kids at home, but it's also the stress of not having enough money for food and rent and um, uh, paying bills. A lot of things may be ending like unemployment insurance. We don't know what's happening with that. Uh, we do applaud the city of Clarkston for having a rent assistance program. Thank you a lot in the city for making that available. And we know there are lots of groups that are doing food banks and, and all kinds of things out there to support families. But I think stress is real and I think it also has a big effect on our children. So we're not, we're not gonna be solving problems tonight. We're really trying to identify what's working and what's not, but we know that's a real issue. I'll have one final question. And it's um, obviously, I have to ask you a question about early learning, right? So what are our families doing about um, early learning? Um, those that have jobs, are they wanting to take their children to childcare centers? Um, what are families doing when, when they have to work and they need childcare. Yes, uh, those parents I spoke with stated that they are less interested to send their children to daycare centers so that they can work. Uh, I, I know one parent already decided not to work and stay home with children so they can do schoolwork and uh, the children won't be home alone. Uh, families are not comfortable, you know, about living their children with others. Uh, I also learned from my experience working virtually with parents that some of them do not have the adequate technology at home. For example, they don't have, you know, updated laptop or Androids to use them at home to help their children with their uh, virtual classroom session. Uh, some of parents also lack the basic skill on how to communicate with the teachers of their children electronically, like, you know, uploading and downloading files, scanning files. So uh, we need to teach, you know, parents these skills and encourage them to train themselves, you know, about how to use this uh, basic technology to help their children at home. And also uh, we need to provide them with a new and adequate computers, laptops, or Androids that are helpful for their children during the virtual classroom. So uh, most of the parents I spoke are not you know, interested to send them to uh, daycare. So you've raised two really important um, issues that the um, Child Care Task Force is addressing. Um, and I think Miriam will also speak to this issue that um, a lot of parents are choosing not to work, which also then limits the amount of income coming into the home because they want to stay with their child. And um, they're also using family, friend, and neighbors to care for their children because they're more trusted and there's a, a fear of going to child care. We'll talk a little bit more about that with Miriam. Uh, but the other issue that the, the task force is looking at and some other partners are is the whole issue of the digital divide and the inequities that are um, resulting, especially now with everything being online. Um, and uh, I just want to say to our, our participants, if you're interested in working with us on any of those issues, uh, please contact us at c uh, info at cdfaction.org or contact me directly. 
um, there's one last thing that, that um, Elatro mentioned to me that I wanted him to mention, um, that going into ethnic stores, what are you seeing? The grocery uh, stores. Yeah, even if uh, most uh, communities are aware of, you know, the prevention method, uh, I see some of them are not applying, you know. I sometimes go to these ethnic small little grocery stores and restaurants and I don't see people wearing a mask, you know, they stay together, they chat together, you know, they spend time together in these little uh, ethnic uh, restaurants, but uh, it is less likely that they, they wear masks. Uh, uh, and also, uh, I recommend, you know, uh, uh, for anyone uh, or any organization who is involved in uh, health education for the community, there is still a, a need to continue to teach the community and make available different type of resources to help them. One of the things, uh, and I'm going to end this so we can move on to the next panelist, but one of the things that, I, that you've recommended is that organizations uh, try to get masks into some of these ethnic stores so then when people come in without them, they can just give them to them, right? And that's something we really hadn't done before. So that may be a project if there's somebody out there looking for something to really help is to start getting masks to some of the smaller grocery stores. Well, I'm gonna thank you for uh, being with us. I know there's some raised hands, but I, I think what we'll do is go to our next panelist and then we'll take questions for um, all the panelists at the, at the very end. And I think Ashley will, will um, uh, moderate that. So I'd now like to um, um, invite Miriam Gibson, um, who's the CEO and Executive Director of Scottsdale Early Learning, to talk to us a little bit. Um, Scottsdale is a nationally accredited and a, a very high quality early learning program located right side, outside of Clarkson. And um, I had the pleasure of many, many years ago of serving as the board chair of Scottsdale when it was in Toby Grant um, housing project on North Decatur Road, which has since been torn down. So I have a long history and, and, and passion for Scottsdale and its work. Uh, Miriam and I have had many, many, many conversations about lots of things, including COVID-19. And I'm looking forward to having a virtual conversation with her tonight. Uh, and I'm sure that you will all benefit from some of her experiences. So welcome, Miriam. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And first, tell us a little bit, uh, just a little bit more about Scottsdale Early Learning, the demographics and the children you serve, and the programs and the partners. Well, Scottsdale Early Learning is an early childhood program, and our uh, main location is in Scottsdale, Georgia, and that's where we started, as Roberta mentioned. We also have a center-based location in Decatur now, and we have a parents as teachers program that actually serves families throughout DeKalb County, and we also have the Clarkston Ready Schools, which we do in conjunction with CDF Action. There's one in Clarkston, and there's one in Stone Mountain, um, and we have a variety of partnerships to support the families. Uh, we partner with the county, we partner with Great Start Georgia, um, and we have a MESHIF-based um, parent education program um, called Parents as Teachers, and uh, we also have Early Head Start, and we have some other partnerships with Bright from the Start as well. Um, and really the whole goal of the organization is to make sure that children in DeKalb County enter kindergarten ready to learn. And so our goal and our space really is to make sure that any child can come to our program. It's very high quality, is accessible to families, whether the families can't pay anything or whether they're prepared to pay market rate. Anyone can come to the program. Um, and so it really is a blended community. Um, so where we have early Head Start children, we have children that pay, we have children that are on scholarships. Um, and we do a lot of fundraising to be able to offer scholarships so that families uh, can have a rate that's affordable to them, but still have a program that is very high quality. So it was really hard, and I, I know that childcare centers um, in Clarkson, in Georgia, and across the country are really struggling to know what to do to make the decision, just like swimming pools, right? Do you, well, not quite, but do you open, do you close, do you have rules, do you make it safe? Um, what do you do? Because we know that parents need to work and uh, childcare is how they're able to do it for many families. 
Um, so the decision I know to close in March, which you were a center that chose to close, and we have others in Clarkson that chose to stay open, was a hard one for you. And what factors led to your decision to close in March? And how do you stay in contact with families? Yes. Um, so for us, the decision to close was really made based on looking at what our families were saying and what the demand was going to be. So a lot of the families had actually come to us and they were saying, the schools are closing, different programs are closing. When are you all going to be closing? Because I want to keep my child at home. And so when we started looking at that, we realized that uh, our community was asking us to close. And we also did some um, conversations to see what families would be impacted in terms of work. And by and uh, large, we only had a couple of families um, that said that they had would have some struggle, but because they also had school-aged children, they were already planning to get some in-house care uh, for all the children as well. So uh, for us, the right decision was to close for our families, for our community, just to be safe and close all of our programs. And so we closed from March until June. Um, and we stay in touch with our families through a variety of methods. We have a program called Kinderlime. Um, it's now part of the ProCare system, but it's basically just an app that families can put on their phone. We send messages to them throughout the day. We can send pictures, um, notes about whether the child took a nap, different things like that. But during down the um, actual closure, we use that to communicate with the families. Um, we provided resources to them on um, if they needed rent assistance, if they needed food, if they needed diapers, anything that they needed, they communicated with us and we could either send them to a resource or provide it directly to them. And so we kept an open line of communication throughout the closure with all of our families just to check in and see how they were doing. And the teachers um, were actually part of this as well. So they called the families every week just to check in. And we also did some Zoom classrooms as well, just to stay engaged with our families during the, that time period we were closed. Okay, and I do know that you did offer a, a small pre-kindergarten transition program at the center funded by the state this summer. Um, could you share with us what, <clears throat> a little bit about the Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning guidelines um, and what what if a center does, does stay open, what are some of those guidelines? Because some of the participants and some of our families are wanting to use childcare and, and may try to go back to childcare. And I know you um, uh, really spent a lot of time uh, working on your center to make it ready for children. So can you share some of, some of those guidelines with us? And I, I believe we have a slide that gives the information about, um, yeah. The, so um, there are a lot of recommendations and for us. We followed all of the ones with right from the start, but we also had some others from some national programs that we followed as well. Um, but just to kind of walk you through um, some of the differences and changes when a child arrives um, in the morning now before their parent would get them out and walk them in. And now as much as possible, we ask our families to do carpool. Um, and when that carpool happens, they'll call and say, you know, I'm here with the child and a teacher or a family support specialist will come out. They actually take the child's temperature in the car. Um, the parent signs the child in on their own device so that there's no handling of different devices or pins or anything. And at that time, they also certify that the child has not been sick um, over the last 24 hours. They haven't had a fever, that nothing is going on with them um, that would be of concern. And so at that point, the child has their temperature taken, they've scanned, they say goodbye. They actually, the uh, teacher or the family support person will walk the child into the building. And then once the child gets in the building right at the door, um, we have a little station where each child sits. Um, we, they sanitize their hands, they get their mask for the day, um, and they also change out of their shoes. And so they take their shoes off, their shoes are sanitized on the bottom with a disinfectant. Those shoes go into a bag called home shoes and then they have a pair of shoes for school that they put on. And so they wear those shoes throughout the day. At that point, they are ready to go back to their classroom. So the teacher will walk them back to their classroom. When they get to the classroom, they wash their hands for 20 seconds with soap and water um, and sing, you know, either happy birthday or their ABCs. Um, and so just that process is very different for us um, before um, a lot most of those things were not happening. The hand washing was happening in the classroom, but it all looked very different. And we're really just trying to minimize 
any risk in the building and additional families or additional people there. So the only people in the building are teachers, staff that have to work in that building who are working directly with the children or the teachers and the children. So um, the environment is a lot uh, smaller than it used to be. We don't have visitors, we're not doing tours, we don't you know, have people coming in doing any kind of visits because we wanna keep the children safe, that's our priority. Um, even once they're in the classroom, the teachers are doing a lot more sanitizing throughout the day. They're making sure the children are keeping their masks on, they're wearing masks throughout the day. The teachers are all wearing smocks to keep themselves clean and they'll change those as they need to. Um, if a child gets sick or starts displaying any anything that would be a concern, that could be diarrhea or it could be, um, you know, having a cough or, or different things going on, they actually will call up front and that administrator will come and get the child, bring them up front to a separate area where the child will um, stay with that person and, um, until their parent comes and picks them up. So he, once there's any symptom, they're not kept in the environment with the other children. Um, and so even for meals, so the meals come from the kitchen, instead of doing family style, which um, everyone really used to love, it is a big thing. Now we do individual meals for each child that's already wrapped and ready to go and each child is sitting more spaced out they're not close to each other um, because you know children will share food if they're sitting <laughs> they're sitting next to each other so we space the children out so that um, there's not a lot of sharing and then um, even story time we're we're encouraging the children to be spaced out we're encouraging them to try different centers on their own and do activities on their own so that we don't have a lot of children grouped up um, and then the teachers spend a lot of time reminding children to keep their masks on and to keep their mask up <laughs> um, as, as you know with little ones you can only imagine and so for us it really has been uh, just a big shift into being more intentional with each specific child about how we can help them stay safe throughout the day working with the family so that they know as well um, these are the things the child needs to know um, and for us when we have children that really are struggling to wear masks we tell the parents to wear the mask with them as much as they can even if it's at home um, just small things because it helps normalize it um, the, we've had a lot of children who really don't mind wearing the mask so for them they've had to get used to so many things I think of little ones and for them my little one I have a four-year-old she would prefer to never wear shoes but she knows she has to wear them when she goes out so she's gotten used to it um, and so for the, for her the same thing with the mask she would prefer not to wear it but she sees me wear it so she knows that this is part of the process so as much as I do it um, is as much as she'll do it and we also encourage them to use little fun things telling the children um, uh, one of our teachers said this, they're superhero masks with the children love. And my daughter likes calling it her ninja mask. Um, and so things like that make it fun for them. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, if, if people are interested in the um, Georgia Department of Early Care and learning uh, guidance for child care, uh, we have that available to you. We do have, uh, Scottdale is, is closing um, in, in part because um, of the increase in the coronavirus um, in the state and in our communities. Um, everything's going virtual, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, but this is a, a, a something that I think parents will have to really decide um, on themselves whether or not they use the childcare center. We do have some in Clarkson that are open and they are following the guidelines and we'd be glad to share that information with you as well. Well, we're going to end this this piece and um, going to turn it over back to Ashley, who will now moderate uh, our participant and panel conversation. So those of you that have questions, we'll uh, be able to ask them now. Ashley. Hi, welcome back. Um, so let me check back in with Erica um, and or Linda and see if there have been other questions posed by any of our attendees during the last two interesting panel discussions. Hey Ashley, it's Erica. I don't see any questions in the chat box yet, um, and I don't think I see any hands up currently. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to let us know. I wonder if, um, if Susan, if you might be able to comment at all on what you're reading in terms of why it is that we seem to be seeing children 
um, kind of reacting differently to COVID-19 compared to adults, right? So we're seeing some initial evidence that children under 10 um, are less likely to infect others. Um, and then I've also seen some data that children may be less likely to even get infected in the first place, as well as perhaps less likely to spread it to other people. Um, and I'm just wondering what you're reading about why that is potentially. Yeah, um, let's see, am I, uh, yes, I'm unmuted. I think that nobody knows the answer to that question. That is kind of the million dollar question. We know that children are le much less likely to become ill. We're not sure if it's because they don't mount as robust an immune reaction. We know that the chemicals that are part of the immune reaction, the cytokine storm that probably people have read about, is what is making a lot of the adults very ill. And children don't seem to mount that. We know that children may have different receptors for this virus. Um, we, let's see, we know that children for the most part have healthier blood vessels and people have, scientists have hypothesized that healthier blood vessels uh, are protective for children. So we're really, we're really not sure why children are not getting as sick. Um, in terms of children passing it on, little kids may not cough. Uh, their, their coughs may not be as strong as older children. Uh, and so each cough uh, may not spread the amount of virus. And in someone who's asymptomatic, uh, and many of the children, as we know, are asymptomatic or just very mildly ill, they're not coughing quite as much uh, as the adults who cough. One of the questions that um, Elantra asked was, um, or, or parents asked of him, is if I've had the, the virus, can I be reinfected? Mm -hmm. That's a question that, that gets asked yeah. a lot. Yeah, and, and we don't know the answer to that question either. And uh, that's why I posed it, because <laughs> we don't. We believe that there is some short-term immunity, but we don't know how long that immunity is going to last. And so our advice to people, if they've gotten infected, is to continue to wear masks, continue to socially distance. Um, we'll know more about that probably in another six months, another nine months, but we don't have the answer yet. And we're assuming reinfection is possible. There's a lot being done right now with respect to testing vaccines, right? Um, and you know, from a, a pediatrician's perspective, I was wondering if you could comment at all on what you're reading or hearing about vaccines for kids. Because what I've seen thus far, none of the trials of COVID vaccines are including children. Um, and so it seems at this point that we will not um, include children in a potential vaccine um, campaign when it is ready. So I don't know if you are reading anything that can shed light on that. Ashley, I, I really haven't. Um, I, I agree with you. It, it appears that the vaccine trials are being done in individuals who are over the age of 18. Uh, right now, I think these initial safety trials are excluding children or excluding a lot of the elderly as well, uh, who of course, you know, are, are very vulnerable. I think that once the safety trials are done um, in the age groups where it's being tested, I'm hoping that they're going to expand uh, the trials and include children as well as the elderly. Uh, but right now, you're right, we, we're not getting that information. Yeah. Miriam, one of the uh, things that you shared with me was that in, instead of bringing children to childcare, that a lot of parents are opting to have um, the neighbor down the street or a friend or a family member care for the children. Um, and of course that's been done in our community for a long time, but we're seeing a big increase and maybe Susan would like to weigh in on this as well. What are the risks of, of, of children being cared for by the neighbor down the street? Um, and what do we need to be doing to protect children in these situations? Yeah, that's a good question, Roberta. Um, for me, I would say um, the things that need to be done are, of course, um, considering background checks 
on anyone who might be um, potentially watching your child, um, no matter who they are, and also asking the questions about who else will be in the home while this child is being cared for. Um, so if a child, if a home is licensed through Bright from the Start, they want to know not just who the caregiver is, but who else is in that home throughout the day, because that also matters. Um, and then beyond that, asking questions such as about CPR and safety. Um, if a child hurts themselves, do you know what to do? What are your steps going to be? Um, what is your discipline technique? If this child is really acting up, what are you going to do? What, what are you, you going to do to correct that behavior? Um, because asking these questions beforehand is really important. And I think people would be surprised when you ask some of those questions about the responses you get and what people's, uh, what one person thinks is okay might be really not okay for another person. So having those conversations and then also um, being aware of what the resources are. I know that um, there are, you know, a lot of resources online, like through Quality Care for Children, where you can see what are questions you ask child care providers or different people, and they can just kind of inform what are some of the things that I need to to ask to feel like my child is going to be safe there. Um, and then also consider, I think, um, what is the risk that you're trying to avoid and are you sure that you're avoiding it by using informal care versus uh, using a child development program or using someone who's licensed? Because sometimes it's more of a perception that there's only gonna be these three kids here and it will be better. But if uh, guidelines aren't being followed, between the children in terms of their bodily fluids and how they're being changed and what's happening, that just those three children, there something could happen very quickly, something could spread. Um, and so I just think that um, people having those those conversations in their family to say, what, what is the risk that we're willing to take um, and why is gonna be really, really important. And then how do we prepare um, that neighbor if that is uh, the case to, particularly know about COVID-19 and, yeah. and find out exactly what she uh, what she's doing during the day with the children. Yeah. Uh, to yeah. see that as an issue surfacing in our community a lot. Yeah. 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 And I would add one additional thing. You want to make sure that the children that you're around are up to date with their immunizations and oh, yeah. inquiring about immunization. Um, hygiene was already mentioned, but super important. Uh, during this COVID time, having masks available, I think, for, you know, depending upon the age of the children as well, and making some unexpected visits, drop-ins. So maybe arrive two hours before you were expected, just to see what's happening, I think is always a good idea. You know, um, I've seen some reports of increases in family violence during this time. I'm wondering if Susan, Miriam, Alessio, any of the three of you, all of you might comment on what you're seeing and hearing with respect to that and um, what are some strategies that we can all use for, um, for identifying this if it's occurring, what to do if we are experiencing it or seeing it with another family. Um, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll ask Susan first and then Miriam and then Alashu. So absolutely, we are reading about um, an increase in domestic violence during this very stressful time for families. Uh, personally, I haven't seen it in our offices, uh, very fortunately. Uh, but we're certainly on the lookout for it. You know, the schools really have been the eyes and the ears for, for children. The, the, the schools do so much more than just provide education. They really, you know, help identify children are, who are at risk. They, um, they make social service referrals. They provide mental health. And we've got to get this COVID problem under control so that kids can get back to schools. Um, I think if anybody is concerned about a child uh, in, in a home calling the Department of Family and Children's Services, uh, making a defax referral is the most appropriate thing. Uh, people should never be afraid to make a defax referral. It doesn't mean a child is going to be taken away if a referral is made. It simply means that uh, you've brought attention to that family and there's going to be an investigation. Uh, so as pediatric providers, 
uh, we are certainly encouraged whenever we are concerned about a child. And I have done uh, several of those uh, over the course of my career. Um, well, I will um, chime in and say that we have also, I've been reading about it. We have not, it's not something that we've experienced. Um, but one of the things we've been trying to do with our families is just provide resources to them. Um, and so for resources, I think about mental health resources. I think about outlets, um, ways to talk, um, you know, and get things out. Um, one of the things that we did during our closure that we'll do again is just some groups where um, not just the, the children are um, able to see their peers, but that parents can get together and just talk as parents and just get a sense of, you know, um, that some of the things that you're dealing with are really um, their typical behavior for a three-year-old. You know, if you're not aware of what typical behavior for a three-year-old is, you might think you're the worst parent ever um, because, <laughs> because three-year-olds um, can really do some interesting things. They can really choose some interesting things to do. Um, and it will make you wonder, what am I doing wrong? Or, or is this really bad? Or, um, and so I think some of that, um, the opportunity to talk with other families and to communicate, particularly if they're not necessarily a close friend or a relative where you feel like you could be judged or people are going to ask you about it later. You know, just other people who can say, oh my gosh, yes, my child also tried to eat a whole tube of toothpaste and I had to put it up really high. I had no idea that, you know, little ones would think that toothpaste was dessert. Um, but these are the things that, you know, I think as much as you can create a community around people so that they know that, um, you know, these things are okay and just to help bring down some of that stress level um, because to me that's the one thing that we did here when we talked to families is that some were just really stressed they were um, and I've said to you you know I've spent more time with my children in the last three months than in a really really long time which it is it's been great but it also has its challenges too um, and so getting some new coping skills around being at home with your children all throughout the day, every day is really important. And I think that's a conversation we're not having enough. What do parent coping skills look like now versus what they looked like when we were dropping our children off at 8 a.m. and then picking them back up at 5.30? And then we had that really tough window of time before they go to bed. Now that tough window of time is all day long. And so as much as we can, we try to provide resources and outlets for the families. And then also we are also, um, you know, uh, mandated reporters and so if there's anything that rises to our attention we will call that in um, because we want every child to be safe. I want to jump in really quick I think one of the things that we've done are the zoom calls and parents have learned to use zoom and there is much about building relationships and sharing and debriefing and having a good time and I think um, those have been extremely helpful not only um, for the children but for the parents as well. So when we do our early learning calls, we are really clear that at least the first 10, 15 minutes is checking in, seeing how people are doing, laughing a bit, uh, bringing some joy. And I think that's just really important in these stressful times. And the other thing I'd like to say is that I am really um, proud and, and that the, so, many, so many of our parents are really doing so well. Um, and yes, there may be a rise in some areas, but we've also seen some very strong parents in our community that are coping and doing the best they can and laughing when they live in a small apartment. And this one mom said to us, we go to one room and we do this kind of play and we go to another room and we do this kind of play and then we go outside and then I try to figure out something else to do. But our parents are being really creative, I think in many ways uh, and showing just an awful lot of stre uh, strength as well as stress. So, Lacho. Uh, yes, um, I share what uh, you guys said about domestic violence, especially most, uh, People who are victims of uh, do, uh, domestic violence don't come and share their experience openly, you know. But still, we can contact, you know, the churches and some community associations. These are the institutions. They first go and report if they face some domestic violence. So we still need to work with these uh, institutions, you know, to address those problems and provide resources 
to these community uh, associations uh, or churches so that they can provide those resources to the victims when they come to report what they experienced. So that's what uh, I can say regarding domestic violence. Well, I think we're about ready to close. And um, I think there, um, Roberta, there there's one. Question? Yeah, there's one more question. Okay. Um, and Eric, I think um, if I, I'm going to try to remember what this said in the chat. I think the question was about whether masks are still needed outdoors if people are social distancing, so six feet apart. Do children still need to wear masks um, if they're outdoors, but, but six feet apart? Uh, so I, I can take that. I, I, if you can maintain the six feet of distance, it's, it's not necessary to wear a mask outdoors. Okay, thank you. Erica, um, any other questions last minute? questions in the chat at this point? Hey Ashley, it's Erica. I don't see anything else. I don't see any hands up. So I think we're good. Okay. I would Roberta? just, unless you're, you know, with a, if there's a lot of people around. So that would be the caveat. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. That's helpful. Well, I uh, want to thank all of you for attending. A special thanks to all of our panelists for the insights, the guidance. Um, we really appreciate your time and your expertise. Roberta, do you have any final words? Just the only final word, another thank you to our panelists and to remind people that the conversation continues, that we are planning uh, part two of this conversation for Thursday, um, August 13th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And we invite you and, and other folks to come back and and continue to uh, talk about COVID-19 and children. So thanks and have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you.